to the uh, Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming. Uh, today's hearing is entitled New Energy Technologies, What's Around the Corner? Today we look to the future. We look to the future of how our country and our world will be powered. We do so by examining new ways to run our homes, vehicles, and businesses. We need to change because the status quo, sending billions of dollars to countries that don't like us much, and sending billions of tons of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere is not sustainable. We need to develop technologies that will lead us to even greater prosperity and a cleaner and more secure world. We are at a watershed moment in the history of energy production, and the choices we make at this juncture will shape our national and economic security in the next several decades and determine the fate of our planet. Between now and 2030, over $20 trillion will be invested in new energy infrastructure worldwide. And an estimated $1.5 trillion will be invested in the U.S. power sector alone. This new infrastructure is long-lived and costly, so we need to get it right. The decisions made in the next decade will set the course of the global and U.S. energy system and of the global climate for the next century and beyond. This transition also presents an unprecedented opportunity for economic uh, development uh, and job creation in the clean energy technology sector. But the United States must act now if it is to be a leader in the rapidly developing global market. A few weeks ago, the House of Representatives took a giant legislative leap in America's historic effort to win the next great technological revolution, the clean energy race of the 21st century. On June 26, the House passed the first comprehensive clean energy and climate bill in our nation's history, the Waxman-Markey American Clean Energy Security Act. The bill would, for the first time, put a cap on carbon pollution that causes global warming and establish ambitious policies for the development and deployment of clean energy and efficiency, invest nearly $200 billion in the next 15 years to make America once again the leader in energy technology. We need to pass this bill because for the past decade we have fallen badly behind in the clean energy race. Of the top 30 clean energy companies in the world, only six are American. Portugal, Spain, and Denmark produce 9%, 12%, and 21% of their electricity from wind, respectively. America produces about 1% of its power from wind. But I am an optimist. I am a technological optimist, and I am an optimist about America's ingenuity and the American entrepreneurial spirit. I know that we can and that we will win this race. We have witnesses here before us that are engaged in developing the technologies that we need. We could have invited other technology companies, but today I wanted to focus on businesses that are forward-leaning on solar technologies and on ways to find a path forward on coal. Their solutions range from developing higher solar efficiency to manufacturing innovations that would reduce the cost of solar cell production to capturing the CO2 from power plants and putting it under the seabed or combining CO2 with seawater to make cement. I have no idea whether these companies will succeed or fail, or whether other companies with better ideas or more inspired execution will win. That's not our job, to pick the winners and the losers, to know which technology will capture the day and which will fall by the wayside. But I do know that if we put the right policies in place, we will unleash the greatest force for change on the planet, American entrepreneurialism and ingenuity. This was the lesson from the 1990s and the communications and information technology revolution. I believe that the situation is no different with clean energy. I look forward to hearing from today's witnesses. We now turn and recognize the ranking member of the committee, the gentleman from uh, the state of Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Today's hearing on clean energy asks what's around the corner and focuses on two types of energy production, clean coal technology and solar power. 
These power sources should compete with each other in an open market with other sources like nuclear power, wind energy, hydropower, and other advanced technologies. Competition will drive technological advancement and technology will improve our energy security and reduce our CO2 emissions. Congress cannot choose winners and losers in the competition. Experience in the market must dictate which of these technologies are viable and what mix of them can best power our economy. What's best for D.C. may not be what's best for my district in Wisconsin, which is why Republicans call their energy policy all of the above. All of the above means allowing all technologies a fair opportunity to compete. Competition between businesses drives economic growth. But if bureaucratic carbon emission schemes like the cap and tax become law, new technology will compete for government subsidies and emissions credits and not for new consumers. GM and Chrysler are examples of what's to come. These companies accepted government bailout funds to stay in business and then invested it in lobbying the federal government on climate change legislation not an example of what the people want their tax dollars to be working for. While perhaps lucrative in the short term, government subsidies cannot sustain our economy. Coal accounts for half of all electricity generated in the United States. We cannot keep the lights on throughout our lifetime without it. Finding a way to use it cleanly is therefore critical. Clean coal technology has some promising developments recently. In June, researchers in my state announced the successful carbon capture test at the Wee Energy's Pleasant Prairie facility. Their researchers were able to use chilled ammonia technology to capture nearly 90% of the target carbon dioxide emissions. I recognize Gary Spitznogel of American Electric Power, who is here to tell the select committee about his company's 20 megawatt test project at the Mountaineer Power Plant in New Haven, West Virginia. This project is larger than the present Prairie test project and utilizes the same chilled ammonia technology. Hopefully, this is the next step forward in the development of carbon capture and storage technology. While this process could be the next step in development of this technology, it's not the final step. The Mountaineer power plant is a 1,300 megawatt plant. The 20 megawatt test project is capturing just a small fraction of the carbon emissions that could be stored. With its aggressive cap on carbon, policies like cap and tax could lead utilities and researchers to abandon carbon capture and storage technology before it advances. Many utilities will be tempted to move onto natural gas or other technologies that will help meet their carbon cap. This could end development of clean coal technology and potentially leave America's most affordable and abundant source of energy out of the mix. Let us hope that that is not what lies around the corner. Clean coal is showing promising technological developments. Coal can and must remain a central part of a diverse energy portfolio that includes renewable technologies like wind and solar and other carbon neutral technologies like nuclear and hydropower. I look forward to learning more about these technologies and how government policy can encourage the development of a diverse portfolio of energy production that strengthens both U.S. security and the environment. And I yield back the balance of my time. Great. gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, most assuredly, Congress doesn't have to pick winners and losers. Uh, but it is important to provide a framework. That's what we've done historic, historically with the development of energy resources. Uh, we have had government policies that have dealt with coal, oil, uh, timber. Uh, nuclear energy uh, has uh, received the most lavish of subsidy and has been part of a uh, rather intense, comprehensive government framework. Uh, what has happened with uh, the enactment, at least in the House, of the landmark energy legislation is providing a framework for the future. I look forward to uh, having the record develop here today about what the possibility is for innovation uh, in our country moving forward. Um, the innovation is going to be much uh, accelerated if, in fact, we do have a framework that deals with carbon emissions 
that deals with providing subsidies for energy supplies for the future uh, rather than focusing on those in the past. Most important, this is where the world is going. And we have seen example after example, and you mentioned some of those, Mr. Chairman, in your opening statement. Uh, this is the economy of the future. Uh, hopefully, we're able to get our priorities straight, our signals aligned, so that we can tap the potential that is being described here by the uh, witnesses today, and that we'll be positioned to take advantage of it. Last but not least, this is what's going to drive down the prices in the future. Um, the evidence suggests that uh, there is actually minimal cost associated with the legislation that we just enacted, but more important, it didn't take into account the potential for innovation, which we will hear about today. Thank you very much. Great. Gentlemen's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentlelady from West Virginia, Ms. Thank Capita. You. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for hosting today's very important hearing. Uh, last month, the House passed the American Clean Energy and Security Act. While I did not support that legislation because I believe that it stood to push energy prices upward and threaten an economy that is already in trouble, I believe that instead of taxing West Virginia families and companies and picking winners and losers, which I believe the bill does, we need to do more to maintain global competitiveness of our U.S. industries and support and accelerate the development of advanced clean coal technologies, including carbon capture and storage technologies. Here in the United States, we know coal is the most, our nation's most abundant domestic resource with recoverable resources sufficient to last approximately 250 years. Coal currently fuels more than 50 percent of all electric generation. In my home state of West Virginia, 98 percent of our electricity comes from coal. It supports hundreds of thousands of additional jobs throughout the supply chain. Additionally, West Virginia is the second largest coal producing state, so the economic implications of our energy policy to my state cannot be overstated. Carbon capture is important to West Virginians in ensuring our national energy independence. Without it, we deprive ourselves of the most effective tool for addressing CO2 emissions from coal. We need to continue to press C CCS and other clean coal technologies. We need to provide sufficient funding and incentives, which are included in the bill, to accelerate the development, demonstration, and broad commercial deployment of CCS. Very happy today to have Gary Spitznagel here from the AEP Mountaineer plant, which is engaged now in a CCS project. That plant is in my district. I know many of the fine folks who work at the Mountaineer plant. I have visited the facility and also seen where the uh, demonstration will take place. Uh, I look forward to uh, hearing from him and the other witnesses on this important blueprint for, commu for commercial scale facilities. I welcome him as well as a representative of uh, AEP. Um, constituents in my district. The implementation will not only benefit a state like mine with jobs and revenue, but it will also benefit our nation by making clean coal reality. I look forward to testimonies from the panel. Thank you. Great. Gentlelady's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Emanuel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, serving on the uh, Financial Services Committee and listening uh, each week multiple times to economists, uh, along with uh, the Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke and uh, a host of other uh, experts, uh, it does not take uh, much to convince me that we are in the most difficult economic time uh, in uh, half a century, uh, not since the uh, Great Depression. Uh, has the United States uh, been in, in such a, a, an economic condition? Uh, but I am also uh, excited about the fact that uh, during tough times, it, it appears as if the uh, U.S. does its best work. Uh, Microsoft was developed during a recession. Uh, FedEx was developed during a recession. And I am absolutely convinced that we will be able uh, to depend on the scientific uh, ingenuity uh, of Americans uh, to come up with new technologies that will not only help rebuild the economy, uh, but will help save uh, the planet. One of the great, greatest tragedies of, of our uh, little moment 
uh, on this ball that uh, revolves around the the uh, the sun is if the United States does not uh, provide the leadership uh, in developing the new technologies that will in fact uh, help save this planet. In Kansas City, we have created what we call a green impact zone, and uh, we will be announcing on the first uh, a smart grid for 150 block uh, area in the urban core. Uh, we are uh, going to try to develop a whole new uh, neighborhood uh, using the very latest uh, technologies. Uh, Tom Carnahan, the brother of Russ Carnahan, one of our colleagues, has a wind farm not far from uh, Kansas City, where I, I live, uh, that is also proving to be uh, one of the great uh, moves uh, economically in our community. So I am excited about the possibility of coming up with new technologies that uh, will allow us to do things we've only uh, thought about and looked at in, sci in science fiction movies. That day uh, is rapidly upon us, and I look forward to interacting with our panel uh, to find out uh, their view of what uh, we can do and, and what we must do. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from New York State, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this important hearing. And uh, just regarding the picking of winners and losers, I, I would assume that my uh, colleague, the gentlelady uh, on the other side of the dais, is in favor of the billion dollars plus a year uh, for research into carbon capture and sequestration that's in the bill that we passed. Uh, that is, in fact, trying to pick coal as a winner. And this country, as uh, Mr. Blumenauer referred to, has been subsidizing nuclear power for 50 years through the uh, uh, insurance, uh, making the taxpayer of this country the insurer. In fact, it's the only industry I'm aware of that's been wholly uh, 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 backed against a catastrophic accident by public insurance. Uh, nonetheless, I'm particularly interested in hearing about the potential for large-scale solar power development. I've long been a supporter of solar power in the Hudson Valley and the entire country. Um, most recently, we've been creating a market for solar and wind technology in my district. Companies like SpectraWatt and BQ Energy have been uh, creating new production lines, hiring more workers, creating jobs, uh, taking advantage of the R&D money that the federal government is providing to do this cutting edge research. Mercury Solar in my district started three years ago with five employees, now employs 60 people and hopes to be at 80 people by year's end. SpectraWatt is starting with 150, hiring back uh, IBM workers and uh, NXP workers who were just laid off and using 70,000 square feet of empty IBM fa facilities, which are a really good match uh, for producing this kind of product, clean room, positive air pressure to keep dust out, uh, used to handling thin uh, wafers of fragile materials and putting micro circuits on them. It's the kind of thing that matches up the skill set of the workforce with the workspace. And I think uh, I have reason to be optimistic that my district and the Hudson Valley will join the rest of the country in leading in this direction as we go forward into the new energy economy of the 21st century. And I yield back the balance of my time. Right. Gentlemen's time has expired. The chair recognizes the general lady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you for that and I uh, want to welcome our witnesses. We are glad that you all are here. Um, I, th I think it's important that we look at new technologies. I think it's important that we hear from you. Of course, where I come from in Tennessee, coal is going to play an important part in uh, our look forward, as is nuclear and hydroelectric power, and making certain that the innovation and the usage is there, knowing what is going to be coming at us is an important component of what we deal with. We do have um, a, a great new company in Clarksville, Tennessee, that is working on some new technologies and um, Hemlock, which is a part of Dow Corning. We are grateful that they are being an innovator in this, looking at how we move forward with carbon sequestration and continue to build our energy infrastructure. And so look forward to the questions and appreciate your time being here today. I yield back. Great. General ladies, time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Salazar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning. Um, I am a strong supporter of renewable energy technologies, and I am looking forward to hearing uh, the testimony today. 
We have many challenges before us and a wealth of technologies to explore. Colorado and the 3rd Congressional District has great potential for solar. The Bureau of Land Management has identified Southern Colorado as one of its solar energy study areas for the concentrated solar energy production. We currently have an 8.2 megawatt photovoltaic plant in the San Luis Valley with another 17 megawatt plant planned and an additional 6,400 acre, 10 square miles of solar panels to be installed uh, later uh, in a few years. The potential for solar power, power across the West is great. There's also many challenges associated with solar. Um, as you know, uh, water is a scarce resource in many Western states, so we must be thoughtful of how uh, we address the water needs for solar uh, power. Clean coal and carbon sequestration uh, is another technology that I'm looking forward to hearing about today. Uh, coal burning power plants provide half of the electricity generated in the United States. Colorado depends upon coal for the majority of its electricity. The current uh, plan for cap and trade, in my opinion, places an undue economic burden upon Colorado energy users due to the amount of coal that we currently use in Colorado. If we can develop clean coal burning technology as a viable and economic alternative, this will help Coloradans and the rest of the country become energy independent while addressing climate challenges. I am glad uh, to see that two witnesses today are testifying about coal capture technology um, and discussing economically feasible ways to capture CO2 as well as utilizing byproducts. I'm also intrigued by the other uses that we can develop for CO2 uh, that put it in use rather than store it away in geological formations. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I look forward to hearing the testimony today. Great. Gentlemen's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, uh, Mr. Inslee. I'll reserve, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Great. Then we will turn to our panel, a very distinguished uh, panel of uh, innovators. And uh, we'll begin with uh, Dr. Gregory Kunkel, who is Vice President for Environmental Affairs at Tanaska Incorporated. Uh, he helps to develop Tanaska's strategic responses to climate change and is in charge of development and environmental permitting for clean energy uh, projects. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Kunkel. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you, Chairman Markey, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, members of the Select Committee, for inviting me to speak to you about Tanaska's two pioneering carbon capture and storage projects, Trailblazer in Texas and Taylorville Energy Center in Illinois. These projects represent a new paradigm in the energy industry in a carbon-constrained world, linking electricity, carbon capture, and oil and gas production. Using distinct technologies, each project will demonstrate carbon capture at commercial scale, provide clean energy 24 hours a day, and promote rapid expansion of known domestic petroleum reserves through carbon dioxide enhanced oil recovery. My name is Greg Kunkel. I'm Vice President of Environmental Affairs for Tenasca, an energy company based in Omaha. Trailblazer in Texas has a 600 megawatt coal-fired boiler with scrubbers to capture 85 to 90 percent of its carbon dioxide emissions. Recent developments in the Trailblazer project are that Tenasca has selected Fluor Corporation as the EPC contractor. And the Texas legislature has enacted helpful tax incentives and a framework for regulating permanent geologic storage of carbon dioxide. The great promise of post-combustion capture technology, like Trailblazer, is that it can be applied to retrofit existing coal-fired power plants. In the United States, we have the additional opportunity to use the carbon capture enhanced oil recovery paradigm to significantly expand our recoverable domestic oil reserves and production capacity while eliminating emissions of carbon dioxide. There is growing interest in this idea worldwide. Trailblazer and other post-combustion capture pioneers in Asia, North America, and Europe will open the door to retrofit some of the 5,000 power plants worldwide and begin to eliminate the 10 billion tons of carbon dioxide emitted from such facilities each year. The remaining key to advancement of Trailblazer and its great promise is federal emission reduction incentives. When such legislation is passed, our aim is that Trailblazer will be ready. The Taylorville Energy Center in Illinois is a 500 megawatt coal gasification facility that converts coal to methane and then electricity. 
In the process, the project will capture about 60% of the carbon dioxide for use in oil production. Taylorville is the initial clean coal facility under the Illinois Clean Coal Portfolio Standard. The Illinois law sets standards we must meet, including carbon capture, provides a mechanism for sale of electricity, and limits allowable rate impact. Construction will begin in 2011 after completion of current design work, final legislative review, and close of financing. I am pleased to report that the Department of Energy has selected Taylorville for the negotiation phase of its loan guarantee program. Loan guarantees are now critical to capital-intensive energy projects and will significantly reduce financing costs. Those reduced costs, as well as carbon dioxide sales revenues, will accrue to the benefit of ratepayers under the Illinois law. What additional government policies are needed? Perhaps the most important thing Congress could do is to provide regulatory certainty within a climate policy framework that promotes energy independence and emissions reductions. The emergence of the carbon capture enhanced oil recovery, recovery paradigm, among other ideas such as efficiency, renewable energy, and electrification of transportation, suggests that energy independence and emission reductions can be achieved simultaneously and economically. To put the American energy industry to work on these goals, we need a financial incentive for emission reductions that enables the carbon capture EOR paradigm and other good ideas. The Waxman-Markey Bill does much to advance the necessary policy and regulatory framework and supports the carbon capture EOR paradigm specifically. The written testimony I provide to you includes our suggestions in the bill, including optimization of the bonus allowance program to leverage private capital. Thank you again for the opportunity to provide this overview of Trailblazer and Taylorville. I'd be pleased to respond to any questions you have at the earliest opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Conkle, very much. Our next uh, witness is Dr. Brent uh, uh, Costanz, who is the Chief Executive Officer of uh, Calera Corporation. Uh, he is a consulting professor at Stanford University researching and teaching carbonate mineral formation and global carbon, carbon balance. We welcome you, uh, Doctor. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Turn on that microphone. Thank you, Chairman Markey. I'd like to say how much we admire the committee for their foresight in looking at these future uh, technologies for carbon management. I'm going to tell you this morning about uh, a technology which takes CO2 and transforms it into saleable building materials, including concrete and aggregate, and is currently in practice on Monterey Bay in California. We've funded and are uh, building, uh, scaling up to a 10 megawatt equivalent uh, plant next to the largest power plant in the West Coast right now. Um, uh, just to frame things, fundamentally there, there are two approaches to uh, removing carbon from raw flue gas as opposed to just taking carbon out of the air. Uh, one is separation and uh, the, the other is conversion of CO2. So in separation and in, in purification of CO2, it's a uh, chemical process which is, uh, involves um, a high amount of energy and typically takes uh, about 30 to 40 percent of the power generated at a say a coal-fired power plant just to do that separation step and despite any amount of development the, the theoretical maximum from the Harvard study shows that the best it could ever do is to take 25 percent of the power from the plant just to separate it when you're done you're just left with liquid CO2, which then has to be transported, compressed, and, and ejected. The other approach is to simply convert it to carbonate. This has been done for over a century to produce calcium carbonate, which is in the paper here. It's in the paint. Uh, it was in our morning calcium supplement. It's in your milkshake. Millions and millions, trillions of tons of calcium carbonate are produced every day, and it's a very well-known, proven technology. What Calera Corporation has done is developed a way to formulate the polymorphs of the calcium carbonate into useful cementitious materials. To understand the magnitude of the problem, the Kyoto Protocol is calling for 5 billion tons of CO2 to be mitigated. Uh, every year there are 30 billion tons of aggregate sold worldwide, and here in the United States there are 3 billion tons of aggregate sold worldwide. Um, Calera has the ability to sequester over 15 billion tons of CO2 on an annual ongoing basis in aggregate, which can be sold into the concrete and the aggregate markets, as well as uh, Portland cement substitutes. 
99% of all the carbon on the planet is in the form of limestone today. Uh, in fact, there are 70 million to 100 million billion tons of CO2 in the form of limestone today. That's where all, most of the carbon in the planet, the hydrosphere, the biosphere, and the atmosphere have just a few hundred billion tons, a very small amount. Uh, Calaris process involves driving raw flue gas through seawater in the case of Monterey Bay. In most cases, we're working inland, though, with the same geologic brines from saline reservoirs, which are pumped up. That forms the carbonate by adding base, and we have a uh, revolutionary low-energy base manufacturing process. We turn it to carbonate and calcium carbonates and magnesium carbonates. The products are uh, what are called supplementary cementitious materials. They're substituted for Portland cement, and Portland cement itself uh, has a, a large carbon footprint in its production, so we're both trapping the CO2 and avoiding the CO2 from the Portland cement. We also make aggregate, uh, as I mentioned, which is used in concrete and asphalt, and we're doing this every day. We're producing up to five tons a day in Monterey today. It's tested against ASTM standards and ACI standards. So this is a proven technology that is in practice today. Um, I guess the important thing to realize, though, is we're talking about the largest material mass movement in the history of the planet. Humans are producing 20 to 30 billion tons of CO2 a year. And that you need a reservoir that can take that sustainably. And the built environment is the ideal reservoir for the CO2. Concrete is the most transferred material other than water in the whole world. The infrastructure is already in place. Ready-mix plants are pulling up to uh, coal-fired power plants every day and picking up their fly ash and taking it to their ready-mix plants for mixing and concrete. There's no new infrastructure to develop here. We're doing it today. It's ready to move forward. But going from the, our 10-megawatt plant, which we have funded in Silicon Valley and are building today, to the 1,000 and 1,500 megawatt plants that are necessary is going to take hundreds of millions of dollars of government funding to cross that chasm. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor, very much. Our next uh, witness is Mr. Frank Smith. He is a founder and principal of SCS Energy and Pure Gen 1. Uh, there he oversees the development of energy facilities that, according to uh, their company, uh, lead the industry in environmental stewardship and climate change mitigation. We welcome you, sir. Whenever you are ready, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And can you move it over? To, can you move it over just a little bit no, closer? Right. Okay. Good. All right. Good. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, it's my pleasure to testify this morning about new technologies and business initiatives that address our nation's energy and climate cha challenges. At the outset, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you and your colleagues for your leadership in this area. By using a market mechanism to put a value on CO2, your bill and supporting energy policies will transform energy production in the same way that the Telecommunications Act of 1996 spurred a revolution in information technology. SCS develops electric generating plants. We do complicated, large capital projects and we've been very successful. The Pure Gen 1 project located in Linden, New Jersey, promises to be even more so. I want to make sure that the committee hears three core messages about carbon constraints and the state of technology. Using proven technologies available today, we can produce electricity along with other basic commodities at market prices while sequestering 90% of our CO2. We can accomplish that with profitable commercial ventures that meet real market needs. And we can do all of that using domestic resources, resources that include not only coal and rail and capital, but the uniqueness of our offshore geology and the resourcefulness that 1,500 skilled human, human union <laughs> craftsmen will bring to building our plant. The Pure Gen 1 facility, which we are developing right now, is one example. The facility operates a hydrogen plant. That plant produces hydrogen gas from coal. 
Hydrogen is then used to make electricity and urea. In the process, the cap plant will capture 90% of the CO2 it produces, over 4.5 million tons per year. That CO2 will be transported and permanently stored in sandstone formations deep under the ocean floor. Pure Gen 1 does all of this in a dense urban setting where it meets a real and growing market need for generating capacity. This project is a price taker in both the electricity market and the urea market. The consumer will pay nothing extra for the commodities produced from this facility. You see, traditional single-purpose power plants operate for large periods of time at break-even or worse. PureGen is a manufacturing platform that shifts easily from producing electricity to producing urea. This both optimizes the revenues and it uses the plant's capital stock more effectively. With the hydrogen plant as its base, this is relatively easy to do. So we set out to solve sequestration, and along the way, we solve a fundamental problem in electricity generation. The new technology here is in the business model. Everything else is off the shelf proven technology. Even the sub seabed sequestration of CO2 has been proven safe and effective. The oldest and largest ongoing sequestration project in the world is the Schleipner Field in the North Sea. We will sequester in formations, well-explored formations, that are approximately twice as deep and under a much thicker cap rock than those at Schleipner. So PureGen will be more reliable than the most proven large-scale sequestration field in the world. One last point. We do not look at CO2 sequestration as a cost. We look at it as a business. The $20 per ton tax credit in the TARP bill and some cross-subsidization from the hydrogen plant, the, the bill operates at about break-even. But the pipe has capacity for an... What is this? If I run out of time, sir? No, you have not run out of time. Okay. Just notifying us that the, the members are um, being notified that the House is now Sorry. in session. Uh, so you, it will not come off of your time. So you have an additional minute to go. All right, thank you. Um, one last point. We don't look at carbon dioxide sequestration as a cost. We look at it as a business. With the $20 per, ten, per ton tax credit in the TARP bill and some cross-subsidization from the hydrogen plant, the business operates at about break-even. But the pipe has capacity for an additional 5 million tons per year from other facilities. Operating at full capacity, we have a very successful business with a $20 tax credit and 5 to $10 per ton value to the CO2. Pure Gen 1 has started the permitting process for an early 2011 construction start, but there are some challenges. First, big power plants are hard to finance in the best of times, but in the current financial crisis, Congress will need to expand DOE loan guarantee authority for first movers. The $20 tax credit provided by the TARP legislation is capped at 75 million tons. Pure Gen could sequester upwards of 200 million tons in its first 20 years. Congress will need to raise this cap and provide assurance to investors that the credit will be there for the life of the financing. Finally, Congress needs to make clear that offshore leasing of lands for sub-seabed geologic carbon storage is not merely permissible, but a national priority. We look forward to working with the Select Committee to address these issues and for final passage of H.R. 2454. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Smith, very much. Our next witness is Mr. Gary Spitznagel, who is manager of Integrated Gasification Combined Cycle and Carbon Capture and Storage Engineering at American Electric Power. <clears throat> he represents AEP in the Midwest Regional Carbon Sequestration Partnership, a regional partnership of research and industry entities arranged by the United States Department of Energy to study carbon sequestration. Uh, we welcome you, sir. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of the Select Committee, thank you for having me here. And I appreciate you offering me this opportunity to share the views of AEP on power generation and technologies for the reduction of CO2 emissions. We applaud your efforts to explore new technologies that can help 
achieve energy independence while reducing or eliminating emissions of greenhouse gases. In my testimony, I've described AEP's leadership on technology development over the past 100 years, including new generation. Arguably even more urgent than new generation technologies, substantial effort must be placed on retrofit technologies for the reduction of CO2 from existing power plants. The U.S. currently obtains about half of its electricity from a large fleet of baseload coal generation plants, and most of these will be in operation for decades to come. In recognition of this fact, the Secretary of Energy, Dr. Stephen Chu, has recently directed the DOE to invest significantly in the area of post-combustion CO2 capture. The recent changes made to the coal, Clean Coal Power Initiative Program and the DOE-funded National Carbon Capture Center reflect the support needed to commercialize CCS technologies. AEP has teamed up with Alstom to demonstrate its chilled ammonia CO2 capture technology at the 20 megawatt scale at our Mountaineer power plant in West Virginia. With startup planned for just a few weeks away in early September, we will begin to inject 100,000 tons per year of captured CO2 into deep saline reservoirs approximately 8,000 feet below the surface. This project represents the nation's first integrated CO2 capture and storage project at a coal-fired power plant. After successful validation, our plan is to move the technology to commercial scale, demonstrating the entire process at a rate of 1.5 million tons of CO2 per year. Now, if currently available CO2 capture technologies were to be deployed, the resulting energy consumption of these systems would lead to the loss of one-third of the power plant's output. That means a typical 600 megawatt power plant would be reduced to 400 megawatts, and the cost of electricity would be increased by roughly 60 to 70 percent. New technologies such as the chilled ammonia process offer the, offer the promise of reducing this parasitic power loss. However, these technologies are not yet ready for commercial deployment. They must be advanced in a systematic and stepwise manner. AEP's current CCS project represents this next step in the evolutionary progress of technology development. Commercial scale demonstrations of technologies like chilled ammonia will not be in service before 2015, and even when it is, it must be understood that these first pro projects will not be installed with commercial guarantees from vendors, and they run the risk of not continuously meeting high CO2 capture levels. This is why we believe that 2020 is approximately the earliest date when commercially reliable carbon capture systems will be deployable across the industry. A few other technical hurdles must also be considered. At CO2 capture levels exceeding 50 percent, the steam consumption required by conventional capture technologies may jeopardize the unit's ability to continue to produce electricity. In addition to energy demand, CO2 systems require vast amounts of land, and as a rule of thumb, a full-scale system would double the footprint of a typical power plant. Some plants can accommodate this requirement, but many cannot. Consequently, companies may be forced to deploy CO2 capture systems on only a portion of the plant's output. One more significant challenge is the permanent storage of CO2 after it is captured. The extent of available saline reservoirs, injection pressure limitations, and ultimate capacity are all factors that currently are the subject of intense study. AEP's CCS program demonstrates the prudence of taking technology in a safe and stepwise fashion towards commercialization. The timeline for this work again points towards 2020 as a reasonable date for wide-scale availability of the technology. In summary, continued research, development, and demonstration must be supported and is essential to make CCS technologies a reality. We must do more than just simply call for it. Our nations must prepare, inspire, guide, and support our citizens in the very best and brightest of our engineers and scientists. Private industry must step up and start to construct the first commercial plants, and our country must devote adequate financial and technological resources to this enormous challenge. AEP is committed to being part of this important process and to helping achieve the best outcome at the most reasonable cost and timelines possible. Thank you again for this opportunity to share our views. I'll be happy to answer questions. All right, thank you uh, very much. And our next uh, witness is Mr. Sean Gallagher. He is the Vice President of Marketing and Regulatory Affairs for uh, uh, Tessera Solar, the solar development company of Sterling Energy Systems. We welcome you, sir. Well, thank you very much, Chairman Markey, uh, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, and members of the committee. I am Sean Gallagher, Vice President of Market Strategy and Regulatory Affairs for both Tessera Solar 
and Sterling Energy Systems. Uh, Tessera Solar is based in Houston, Texas, and uh, Sterling based in Scottsdale, Arizona. We very much appreciate the leadership that you and your colleagues have shown on renewable energy this year, and uh, we'll work with you to see that that continues. It's a, it's a great pleasure to have an opportunity to address you today about solar power and our concentrating solar uh, power technology in particular. Uh, my companies, Tessera Solar and Sterling Energy Systems, are, are within the NTR family of companies. NTR is an Irish renewable energy development company uh, which owns a portfolio of primarily U.S.-based businesses, including an ethanol company based in Omaha, Nebraska, called uh, Great Plains Renewable Energy, uh, the wind energy company mentioned earlier, uh, called Wind Capital Group, that's based in St. Louis, Missouri, and a recycling business with operations in Ireland, uh, the U.K., and the U.S. In May 2008, uh, NTR uh, invested $100 million in solar power manufacturer Sterling Energy Systems and created Tessera Solar as the project <coughs> development arm of the business. So the two companies that I represent, Tessera Solar and Sterling Energy, are sister, company, sister companies. Uh, Sterling Energy manufactures the sun, power, uh, solar power generate, sun catcher solar power generating system that I'll describe in a moment, and Tessera Solar will uh, build, own, and operate the solar farms that are powered by the sun catcher. Uh, solar power comes in two basic flavors. Uh, many people are familiar with photovoltaic panels, which uh, use an electrochemical process to convert uh, sunlight into electricity, uh, and that's not what we do. Uh, concentrating solar power, uh, or, which is sometimes called solar thermal electric, uses the heat from the sun to create mechanical energy that's then converted into electrical, ele electrical energy or electricity. And there are a number of CSP te technologies which are coming onto the U.S. market now, the sun catcher, which is our product, is, is one of those, and it's a form of concentrating solar power. The system, which you can see uh, both on the screens on the sides of the room and on the, uh, the board over here, is essentially a large parabolic mirrored dish. It's about 38 feet across. Uh, the sun's rays are reflected off the dish and focused onto the uh, heat engine that sits out at the end of the boom that you see there. Um, that, uh, that collected uh, heat from the sun gets up to about 1,300 degrees uh, when it enters the front of that heat engine, and that is called a, a Stirling engine. Uh, the Stirling engine is essentially an external heat engine. Any uh, form of external heat can be used to operate the engine. In this case, it's the heat from the sun that's collected by the parabolic mirror dish that uh, heats a, a hydrogen gas and pushes a four-cylinder engine about the size of a motorcycle engine that's housed uh, on the top of that boom. Uh, that four-cylinder engine uh, turns a crankshaft, which turns a generator, which uh, generates 25 kilowatts of electricity right on top of each dish. So in California, that's about 15 to 20 uh, average homes uh, on a peak summer afternoon that's operated, that can be uh, run from the power that's generated by each of these dishes. Um, there are a number of advantages to this technology. Uh, it has the highest solar to grid electric efficiency, which means that fewer raw materials are used. Its modular design allows greater flexibility in project size, less land disturbance, and higher on-sun availability because there's no uh, single point of failure. Uh, third, this technology uses far less water than any other uh, concentrating solar power system, uh, up to a thousand times less than some comparable systems. And of course, it uh, does not emit any greenhouse gas emissions uh, or other ha hazardous byproducts. And because we're building at utility scales of hundreds or thousands of megawatts, uh, many, uh, many tons of uh, greenhouse gases are, are avoided. The supply chain for this technology is automotive. Our supply chain partners are primarily based in the upper Midwest, and they'll be converting existing automotive capacity to, uh, to produce solar power components at a commercial scale, putting auto workers back to work. When we get into commercial uh, volume production, we'll be creating up to 4,000 jobs across the supply chain. Uh, beginning next year, in 2010, Tessera Solar plans to break, break ground on two of the world's largest solar far farms in Southern California. These projects will produce up to 1,750 megawatts of clean power. Uh, they'll create uh, 300 to 700 jobs, construction jobs as they're being, uh, as they're being built, and on the order of 100 uh, op permanent jobs, operations and maintenance jobs. We'll also be building the first uh, concentrating solar power plant in Texas, and we're developing a supply chain, both uh, sorry, a project pipeline both domestically and internationally. So we'll be creating jobs in the U.S. for, for export. There are a few things that the Congress can do to help bring this technology to, to fruition. Um, first of all, uh, the Department of Energy has got to get the loan guarantee uh, rules out. Uh, it's been six months already since the stimulus package was passed, and we still don't have the uh, loan guarantee materials. Uh, Congress should consider 
uh, extending the commenced construction deadline for the, receiving the grant in lieu of ITC by a year in recognition of the fact that the loan guarantee has been delayed thus far. Uh, the two programs really work together. If you can't get the loan guarantee, you can't get into construction to get the, to get the grant. Um, we'll also need transmission uh, to bring this power that's uh, produced gener primarily in the U.S. Southwest to the rest of the Western United States and across the country. It's a great pleasure to have an opportunity to address you here today, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gallagher, very much. And our final witness is Dr. Emmanuel Sachs. He is the Chief Technical Officer and Co-Founder of 1366 Technologies. Uh, Dr. Sachs is a Professor of Mechanical Engineering at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and holds over 40 patents as inventor or co-inventor of technologies for manufacturing processes and solar cells. We welcome you, Dr. Sachs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> the challenges of global warming and energy security present extraordinary opportunities to grow new industries and to remake our industrial society in a sustainable form. Not since JFK marshaled us to go to the moon have we had such a clarion call to our young people to do well while doing good. And they have heard this call on their own. The opportunity to energize generations of engineers, scientists, business leaders, builders, and policymakers is precious. As an engineering graduate in 1976, I was motivated to work in solar energy by the oil embargoes of the early 70s. Fortunately, the opportunity was there. I was hired onto a DOE-funded program at a photovoltaics company, and within two years, I knew what I wanted to do with my career. The term photovoltaics refers to the direct conversion of sunlight to electricity using semiconductor devices, that is, with no moving parts. I'll use the acronym PV for short. I returned to MIT for a PhD in engineering and invented a new technology for making PV wafers called string ribbon. String ribbon is now the core technology of two companies, Evergreen Solar, a NASDAQ-listed U.S. company that employs approximately 1,000 people at its R&D facilities and manufacturing plant in Massachusetts is one of them. But along the way, from lab to public company, much time was lost due to a lack of resources. In fact, string ribbon lay fallow for eight years, beginning in 1986 when oil prices dropped precipitously and PV funding essentially dried up. On September 12, 2001, I turned my MIT research program fully to renewable energy. This was my personal response to the events of 9-11. My students, staff, and I created three new technologies in PV. In 2007, I co-founded 1366 Technologies to take these inventions from the lab at MIT into industry. We are now 25 people working to change the energy landscape, and we are one of 150 solar startups in the U.S. This chart captures some of the history of PV and the rationale behind our company. It is centered on wafer-based silicon PV, which accounts for approximately 90 percent of products sold. The chart shows the cost of electricity from PV graphed against the cumulative production of PV modules. It covers the period from 1978, when solar cells uh, were used in space, through today, and then projects forward to 2020. What we see is a steady decline in manufacturing cost with production. This is a classic learning curve of the type that characterizes most manufacturing enterprises. The cost reductions are achieved in part by economy of scale. But in PV, the major contribution is a succession of technological advances which act cumulatively to reduce costs dramatically. This situation is similar to the sequence of developments that has kept silicon the dominant material in microelectronics for over 30 years. While PV is already economical in some markets without subsidy, in a few years, <clears throat> unsubsidized costs will drop sufficiently below the price of electricity from natural gas so that we will enter the region of grid parity while still allowing for sufficient profit to sustain growth. Continuation of the current 35 percent annual growth rate through 2020 will get us to parity with coal. At that time, PV will satisfy 7 percent of the global demand for electricity. 
Storage technology to compensate for intermittency will become necessary by 2025. Once this storage problem is solved, PV will become the largest manufacturing industry in history. PV modules are simple, attractive products with proven field reliability, and they are made mostly from sand. The challenge is to bring the cost down. Our aim at 1366 is to contribute key innovations in the march of PV to grid parity. For example, today the highest cost step is manufacturing the silicon wafers that solar cells are built on. Cast blocks of silicon, six inches wide and 12 inches long, are sawn uh, in, into the wafers that cells are made on. The sawing is a slow and expensive process. The worst part is that only half the brick ends up as usable wafers, and the other half of the brick is turned into dust by the sawing process. And it's unreclaimable dust because it's thoroughly contaminated. At 1366, we have a new process for directly producing high-quality silicon wafers with no sawing and no surface treatment required. This single step can save 30% of making the cost of a PV module. From my experience, the biggest issue facing the rise of PV as a global energy source is consistency in funding and in the economic landscape. For example, after a few strong years, the venture capital community has drastically cut back on funding for PV. The current credit crunch makes it difficult to finance the multi-megawatt installations that are central to the future of PV. Federal funding for R&D has been up one decade, down for two, and is now beginning to recover. If you'll pardon me, what I can say is that the up and down federal funding cycle has enjoyed strong bipartisan support. Finally, Mr. Chairman, you asked for thoughts on policy. I am not a policy expert or even amateur, but I note that changes in energy infrastructure take decades, and I can suppose that a primary goal of effective policy should be to smooth out the wild fluctuations which have plagued the development of PV. It would be helpful to provide more support when fossil fuel prices are relatively low and allow the private sector to carry more of the weight when they are high. This proposal is the exact opposite of the natural tendency. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Sachs, very much. Now we'll turn to uh, questions from the uh, select committee uh, members, and the chair will recognize himself. Um, Mr. Uh, Spitznagel, you said, I think, that you did not believe that there would be a commercial, co commercially viable uh, carbon capture and sequestration technology until at least 2020. Is that correct? Mr. Chairman, I believe that's the case when we'll be able to have wide deployment of these technologies with commercial guarantees. Um, in my um, opening statement, I mentioned that 2015 would be the first time we start to see deployment at commercial scale with uh, technologies that do not necessarily come with guarantees. So from that time period to 2020 is the time we see that those first installations are proven, uh, improve, um, process changes are made to make them reliable, and they can be deployed widely. Thank you. Mr. Smith, do you agree with that, that we'll have to wait until 2020 to have a truly commercially viable technology? Well, our plant is scheduled to uh, go into production in 2014, 2015. And the the uh, technologies are known and proven. Um, they are not, it is not a retrofit, and perhaps um, my colleague to the right is talking about retrofit technologies. Those are, maybe those have some different uh, problems. But um, our plant is uh, scheduled to go into uh, production in 2014, 2015. It's commercially viable. It's ready to go. Do you agree with that, Dr. Conkle? The, the, where, where are you in the Spitznagel Smith spectrum? Well, I, I, I think there's, uh, we obviously have a, a couple of projects that are commercial scale that we're advancing in. Those are among, you know, a small group of pioneering projects, and, and those projects will we'll learn a lot from those. I think that's the first step, is to get that group of projects on the ground. 
Uh, and, and then there will be significant improvements. So after 2015, there will be significant improvements all the way down the value chain from engineering to the equipment manufacturers and so on. So we, we do need, the, I think that the pioneering plants, uh, the pioneering efforts are the, the object in front of us now. Uh, but we can build commercial scale facilities now, uh, both gasification and post-combustion. Now, let me come back to you, Dr. Sachs. You, you, I think, said that, this, that, that the manufacturer of solar technologies will become the largest single manufacturing sector, I think you said, in the history of the world. Yes. That, Can that, you expand that, upon that? Sure. So uh, when uh, 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 what, what the production level that we will reach in 2020 uh, is roughly a terawatt uh, a, a year. Uh, and uh, we, we will have to get uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, quite a, a larger uh, production level uh, of several uh, terawatts a year uh, in order to satisfy global demand. Uh, the, the, uh, the price of photovoltaics at that point fully installed uh, will be on the order uh, roughly a uh, dollar fifty a watt. So we're talking about trillions of dollars uh, in, in, uh, in total revenue. And the year that you picked for the point at which solar reaches equivalency with coal in the uh, in the cost to generate electricity is 2020 on your chart. Yes, and that, that is a continuation of the 18% learning curve that photovoltaics has been on uh, since the mid-70s. So, uh, so the part of the curve that you saw from 1978 to today is real data, and then the dotted line uh, is a projection uh, with the same slope, the same learning curve. So you're saying that the same rule that exists, the Moore's law that exists in terms of the power of computer processing exists over here as well? It's, it's not exactly Moore's law, but it's, it's somewhat, uh, somewhat analogous. So uh, what, what technologically what powers Moore's law uh, is the, the, the accumulation of innovations uh, in, in a processing of microelectronics. And so uh, no one company has to invent the entire uh, uh, processing sequence, but rather they build on the shoulders of people who came before them. And that's exactly what's happening in photovoltaics. Okay. Do you agree with that, Mr. Gallagher? In, in principle, uh, Mr. Markey, in principle, uh, I do. Uh, in the concentrating solar power industry, we think we have a similar cost down curve uh, that will enable us actually for the concentrating solar power technologies, the efficiency of uh, solar radiation to grid quality electricity is quite a bit higher than PV. Um, and so we think that we are pretty close to the point where we're competitive with, for example, uh, retail power prices in California already. And we think that as we get into, uh, as we get into volume production, we'll see costs continue to come down through uh, economies of scale, through uh, exercising the supply chain to find the right, right supply chain partners and through improvements in the technology as we go forward. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Gallagher. Uh, Chair, recognize the general lady from West Virginia, Ms. Capito. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the witnesses as well. Let me just make sure um, I'm a little not confused. I'm looking for clarity here uh, because uh, I see uh, some of the stumbling blocks to CCS cost. But some witnesses have testified, I think, that, well, somebody said we need to have the loan guarantees. It's absolutely critical. We need to have the DOE come in with uh, uh, specialized project money. Uh, I'm assuming that all the technologies still need this kind of um, financial impetus to get us to the, let's say, 2020 or 2015, where it would be commercially viable. Across the witnesses who talked about the coal, would that be pretty accurate in your I mean, is there going to be a point where you don't need loan guarantees and other uh, financial uh, impetus to move this technology and make it, um, I don't know, revenue neutral to the government? From, from my point of view. E either. Anybody. Okay. Yeah. From, from my point of view, if it weren't for the financial crisis, I, I think we, that would get less emphasis. But essentially, when, when you do a large power plant, um, you know, you're talking about billions, billions of dollars. 
And the, the problem is that um, uh, you're, you're gonna, when you talk about a first mover, you, you run into the problem of, of bankers and their sense of risk and things like that. If in a more robust economy, um, prior to the problems we had last fall, their, their, uh, their, their fear of loss is compensated by their greed and, and you can get these things done, but, but uh, fear is a more dominant uh, emotion now in the financial communities and so it becomes more difficult. It's particularly true with first movers. Even if all the technologies are proven and you're bolting pieces together, if they haven't seen it before, there's a concern. More yeah. understandable. So, so in terms of in terms of funding this long term, absolutely, the U.S. economy um, will fund this. This is we're we're talking about how to get started problems mm -hmm. from my point of view. Does anybody else? Have yes. Uh, I, yeah, I just say that you know removing carbon dioxide from power plants costs money. Right. And uh, um, we know that. Uh, you know, using the oil industry, we can get paid for the carbon dioxide, so that helps obviously, mm -hmm. and uh, that's pretty much undeniable. Uh, the initial projects are probably going to be more expensive than later projects because we'll learn a lot, mm -hmm. and, and so we hope to bring down the costs. But still, if, there, if society doesn't value emissions reductions, then this probably doesn't make sense. Uh, if society does value emission reductions, then it does make sense. Thank you. Yes. And I guess I can uh, add to the, the comments on the, the concern about risk and um, put in perspective the fact that AEP has obligations to its ratepayers and its shareholders to make good decisions um, and mitigate that risk as much as possible. So um, when you look at these technologies, the first movers are truly the ones stepping forward and taking that initial risk. Um, that's the case even with what we're doing down at our Mountaineer plant at 20 megawatts. We've asked the ratepayers and uh, shareholders to understand the need to do this, and they do. But there again, it's, it's a fairly small scale um, step out. Well, understanding that uh, a lot of times the rate changes go through state, you know, in our case, Public Service Commission, those are tough things to get through. I know you've been through a couple here most recently. Um, let me ask you another question that was kind of a thread I heard through the CCS, is the amount of energy it costs to, um, uh, to, to reduce the carbon emission. Like I think one of them was 25% of the power used in the separation uh, from, I guess, separating the carbon. Uh, I guess as we're looking at, we're gonna have more energy uh, appetite as we move towards this. To, I mean, I'm thinking to myself, well, how are we gonna do this? Well, you know, we're gonna increase our solar, which is gonna help fill in some of the gaps because we're gonna lose energy as we try to cut down our emissions from the coal power plant. Um, do you think this is something that scientifically or technologically we can keep squeezing down how much energy it takes to capture and um, uh, sequester the carbon? Yeah, that, that would be AEP's engineering judgment that we, we're starting at fairly high levels, like you said, 25, 30 percent um, of the parasitic, uh, 25, 30 percent of the power output of the plant to run these technologies. Um, and we believe just like the evolution of uh, wet FGDs through the 70s and 80s and 90s, and, um, and SCRs maybe a little bit more compressed, that there's going to be a, a, um, a growth period there where, where um, we will be under tight constraints for energy and that, that uh, developers with these types of incentives will come up with technologies that are more efficient. So we, we're optimistic that that can happen and that um, chilled ammonia is one of those um, examples that we see a stepwise improvement. Hey, thank you. Unfortunately, my time is up. Thank you. And his time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you to our witnesses. Uh, Mr. Gallagher, I was struck by your testimony uh, about uh, your supply chain, specifically, uh, and I would quote, uh, this technology uses steel, glass, engines. The supply chain is automotive. We are partnering with Tier 1 automotive suppliers to manufacture sun catcher components. Engine manufacturers, uh, uh, mirror facets, uh, windshields, doors, car hoods, the American automotive in industry has the skills and expertise to build this. The industry has existing manufacturing capacity that will be converted for manufacturing of 
solar components, deploying this technology on a commercial scale in the United States and across the world will create jobs in precisely those sectors and regions of the country in which America has been falling behind. As we get into volume production in 2010, we'll be putting auto workers back to work, eventually creating up to 4,000 jobs across the supply chain. It's very exciting uh, news, particularly given the current state of the auto industry. Can you elaborate on this work and give us any more de details about it? Certainly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hall. Um, we, this technology essentially is uh, its engines, and the U.S. Uh, automotive industry certainly knows how to make engines. In fact, uh, in 2007, the U.S. auto industry manufactured about 17 million cars. Uh, this year, it's going to manufacture about 9 million cars. So there's a lot of slack capacity in the U.S. auto uh, uh, industry at this time. And uh, it's, so it's a good time for a company like ours to be going to the auto industry and bringing them new business. Uh, some of our supply, our, our supply chain partners are very excited to diversify their businesses away from uh, auto parts and into energy. Um, the auto industry knows how to make products at high volumes uh, with high reliability and to drive down costs with continuous improvements in the manufacturing process. And so we're excited about uh, using that, uh, that industry and that supply chain to produce uh, solar power uh, at a continuously uh, decreasing cost. Thank you. You also noticed that your technology was developed in collaboration with Sandia uh, National Laboratories. Uh, critics of, some critics of uh, federal policy have said that investments in R&D do not create jobs. I assume you would disagree with that. Well, we, we think we uh, are a pretty good model of uh, the public-private par partnership. Uh, we have uh, had a, a long relationship with Sandia. Uh, we've received from, some funding from the Department of Energy to uh, commercialize this technology. In fact, the pictures that you saw earlier of our new uh, Suncatcher systems are at Sandia National Labs. Uh, that's where the technology has been uh, refined and, and uh, much of the commercialization process has taken place. So we're, we're very appreciative of the support we've gotten from the, uh, from the government and uh, we'll be bringing that into commercial production next year. Thank you, and I assume that uh we're talking about uh, CCS, for instance, we're talking about pilot projects in various scales and various locations with your different uh, companies, but um, all of you uh, on this panel have uh, stressed the need for loan guarantees, for stable uh, uh, requirements for carbon emissions levels and for uh, uh, federal investment to continue. Uh, I would assume that you, probably none of you disagree that there are jobs created by those investments. We, we certainly think so. I mean, if there's somebody who disagrees, please raise your hand or speak up. It may not be on the scale that you'll be at once you get past the pilot stage and into building a full-scale uh, uh, sequestration project uh, that can match a thousand megawatt or greater power plant. I'm sure that's obvious, but, I, but nonetheless, there are jobs being created. Um, Mr. Smith, I'm curious uh, if you're um, generating hydrogen why not burn it and spin a turbine to put power back into the grid and have water be the uh, effluent? Um, we do. Oh, good. Uh, actually, the, the, the trick is, the, the question is this, and it, and it goes to this earlier question of what's the cost of carbon capture. When you make hydrogen, there are some costs of making it. You have to use electricity to create the, the, in the chemical process, and that's sometimes referred to as a parasitic. Unless the energy comes from a renewable that's free. Well, yes, but someplace it comes, whichever mm -hmm. where it is. So the, the issue is this. If you try to assign all of those costs to make it, of making those hydrogen to the electricity generation, you end up with parasitics that look like 25 or 30 percent. If you say, no, no, I have to spend some of that energy to make hydrogen, then what you can do is say, oh, I can do these other things with hydrogen. What our plant does is make electricity when electricity demand is high and it makes, and prices are good, and it makes urea when prices are low. As it turns out, that's, that's a good thing from a carbon footprint point of view and from a national policy point of view. The urea comes from uh, presently is largely manufactured from natural gas. In this case, it will be manufactured from coal. And you get paid for it. And we get paid, yes, I get paid for it, yes, sir. Sure. I, and you're talking prices which are better than the prices for electricity at two in the morning. 
We have more capacity for generating electricity at 2 in the morning than we need, so you turn my plant to making urea. And in that case, if you look at the parasitic, we think that the amount of energy required to capture and compress the CO2 is 10 percent, not 30. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, and again, thank you to our witnesses. Mr. Smith, uh, I appreciated your statement in your, in your testimony where you said the new technology was the business model and the way you all approached uh, your, your situation and that that's why we shouldn't choose winners and losers. And I, I agree. I think that that is something that is important for us to allow you all to be innovators and for us not to sit here and try to choose bit, uh, winners and losers and decide what is and is not uh, going uh, to have the opportunity to see if something actually works. Uh, Dr. Sachs' chart about how long he has worked on, on the cell is a great, a great example of this. I guess what we have to do is figure out how, what we're going to do with all that dust that you have left over uh, in those in those bottles, uh, Mr. Smith, a couple of questions uh, for you about Pergen and your technology. Um, the, do you have any long-term liability concerns about sequestering the CO2 underwater? And the reason I I ask this is because part of my district is Memphis, and we have the New Madrid Fault in the Mississippi River. And we have read some studies that sequestering the CO2 uh, underground may lead uh, to some tremors. And that is something we're very sensitive to in our region of the country. So I would just like to know if you had any uh, long-term liability concerns on sequestration. Well, our, as it turns out, if you, if you tried to describe a perfect geology for storing carbon dioxide, you would describe the uh, site that we're proposing. Okay. It's, it is, I, you have to, I have to be a little careful because I'm on the edge of uh, starting to speak geological, geological speak and I'm not that good at it, but it's on a passive margin. It is tectonically unactive. Okay. Um, it so you is, feel like that is something manageable? No, I, I think it is something uh, that's been proven to okay. be manageable. All right. That, I, I appreciate that. Let me move on with the remainder of the time that I have. Dr. Kunkel, who owns the patents for the CCS technology that you are currently using? Do you all own them or I, individuals? Yeah. No, actually, well, there's a, there's a whole variety of companies involved in this space. As a developer of projects, we're really open to a whole variety of technologies, and, and in fact, you know, we've we've looked at most of the technologies being discussed here today uh, for different projects, and we have uh, solar going in and rooftop and development. So we're a developer. We'll, we'll use any technology that's out there. We we do have a small investment in a company called PowerSpan that has an ammonia technology for carbon capture that we think is very favorable okay. in terms of reducing the energy requirements. Uh, but generally, uh, uh, we look at a wide variety. Okay, thank you for that. And I've got a couple of questions about on ratepayer bills, but I'm so close on time, I'll probably submit those uh, to you because as Ms. Capito said, we're, I think we're all sensitive to what would happen with the rates. Uh, and how this would affect the rate payer. Um, so I'll submit those to you. Mr. Gallagher, I do have a question for you. Your Suncatcher project, you said, is in California and Texas. And I wanted to know if you had any plans for solar plants in the southeast, and if you see this as, as a technology that would be viable for our area of the country. It sounds like you work off of heat units, not off of rays. And of course, this year I was reading an article when you were talking about that, and it looks like our West Tennessee cotton, it needs 25 heat units a day to germinate properly, but it only got 16 to 17 units per day this month. So uh, is Suncatcher looking at anything in the Southeast? 
Well, the, the form of solar energy that uh, concentrating solar power uses is called direct normal insulation. And that form of insulation is the best in the U.S. Southwest. So I think in the next, in the next several years, what you'll see is projects built by our company and others like ours in the U.S. Southwest. Um, the, the sun or the insulation in the southeast is significantly less than in the southwest or the, the form of radiation that this technology needs. I think there is some potential if we move down the cost curve uh, the way we think that we can to, to think about doing projects in the southeast. Uh, but I think the other way to bring solar power to the southeast is to expand our transmission system, our national transmission system. So basically what you have works for one region of the country but not the whole country. At this time, that's, At this time. that's, that's, a, accurate. that's a fair statement. Thank you, sir. You'll back. Gentlemen, lady's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the the uh, algae-based uh, biofuels are getting a lot of attention from some of the major companies like uh, Exxon and um, in Kansas City, Missouri, in, in the district that I serve, uh, Midwest uh, Research Institute uh, has a pilot scale algae uh, production facility. And I'm just wondering uh, whether or not uh, any of you see a commercial potential uh, for algae biofuels. Um, and, and if so, what are the obstacles that are in the way? What can we do? To, to make it more uh, possible. Anyone? Uh, well, I, I'm not an expert on uh, on algae biofuels, but I but I will observe that that's another way to collect solar energy. So that's essentially what that's doing. Algae is attractive because it it's three to five percent efficient in photosynthesis versus a half percent efficient for uh, for green plants. And uh, the point I want to make is that there, there are a number of ways of collecting solar energy that, that are under investigation are, are at different points in their development. You've heard about two, concentrating solar power and flat panels, uh, flat panel photovoltaics. Uh, there is also solar thermal electric, uh, where solar energy is turned into heat, which is then turned into electricity, or the heat is stored to turn into electricity uh, a few hours later, uh, and algae is in that class. So, uh, so uh, as, as someone who works in renewable uh, energy, uh, I, I uh, foresee a portfolio of solutions, even though uh, I'm here to represent photovoltaics. Mm -hmm. Mr. Gallagher? Well, I'd say only that um, uh, my company, as I mentioned, is owned by the Irish infrastructure company, NTR. Uh, they also own an uh, ethanol company in Omaha called Great Plains Renewable Energy. Great Plains has recently made an investment in algae. Uh, so there is a lot of interest in algae uh, as a form of renewable energy production. Uh, most of it's in the R&D stage at this point, but uh, and, and frankly, I, I'm, I can't speak intelligently as to the, the time frame for bringing it into commercial production. Anyone? Dr. Conkle. I, you know, yeah, it's not something we're invested in, although we've been approached, you know, from CO2, we're, we're going to be a carbon dioxide producer and, and capture it for people, and, and the algae people are interested in that. So there could be an interesting synergy between these capture technologies and, and the algae industry. And, the, of course, the, the, the brilliant thing that algae do is they make a, a liquid uh, that could be used as a liquid fuel, which is, is what we're short on. So I mean, it's 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 too um, it's too new to uh, to to ha even have a a good picture of what it might become. Is that kind of where everybody's coming from? Well, uh, it, it just to make the comparison between uh, capturing solar energy through algae and photovoltaics. Photovoltaics has a long history of deployment in the field, and uh, algae does not. Uh, well, since while well, you, you're at the microphone, uh, uh, Professor, uh, you mentioned in your testimony that uh, some of the hurdles to large-scale use of solar technology are storage and, and transmission lines uh, to get the newly generated uh, power to the grid. Uh, what, what are the possibilities that are currently being uh, explored uh, to do this? Is, uh, well, uh, first of all, I, I think the most important thing is to point out 
that those issues don't come to play uh, for uh, almost two decades because uh, what happens now is, uh, for example, photovoltaics, the power from photovoltaics uh, overlaps very well with air conditioning loads. And so uh, it displaces uh, the natural gas peak, uh, uh, peakers, the, the plants that are fired up to, uh, to deal with that peak. And those are very high cost plants. And so that's, uh, that's one of the reasons uh, that, that uh, photovoltaics is so close to entering that grown, uh, zone of grid parity. So that, uh, that can uh, accommodate up to about 15% by most estimates of electricity demand in the U.S. without storing. Uh, and that, we're nowhere near that, so there's a lot of growth potential. But we need to start work on storage technologies because it's, it's a difficult proposition. One of the, the attractive ones uh, uh, solves a few problems at the same time, and that is plug-in hybrid vehicles. Uh, which are, are charged uh, during the day uh, when photovoltaics are working. And so it's a kind of distributed uh, storage, and it also obviously uh, displaces uh, uh, some part of our uh, consumption of, of oil. The other point is that photovoltaics has the merit of being uh, very well distributed. Uh, so uh, it can be done in large power plants, but it can also be done uh, in, in, in amounts as small as home uh, rooftops. And uh, it can be deployed uh, anywhere in the country. Of course, the yield will be less in the Northeast than in the Southwest, but you don't need uh, uh, the, uh, the collimated light. You can have some cloud scatter and still uh, get response from flat panels. Thank you. My time has concluded. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Uh, thank you. First off, thanks for being here. You were the angels descended from heaven just at the right moment. So thanks for you and your whole team's uh, work on this. Uh, Dr. Sachs, I missed something you said about the relative efficiency of, of, of photovoltaics or concentrated solar and photosynthetic prom, uh, processes. And I think there's an interesting competition between, in our transportation policy, having electricity run our cars or a photosynthetic process through biofuels. Is there any sort of master way to look at these two approaches? Does one have any intrinsic, ultimate, greater uh, efficiency or? Well, the, the, uh, uh, the thermodynamic limit of efficiency for photovoltaics is actually over 80%. That is uh, conversion of sunlight to electricity. Uh, uh, the, the type of multi-junction cells that are used on, uh, uh, up to now, up to recently, primarily on satellites, but also now on concentrated ground-based applications, have demonstrated 40% uh, efficiencies. Those are quite expensive, and the majority of product is in the 15 to 20% range. Uh, <clears throat> so whether there is a thermodynamic limit to the efficiency of a biological process I'm sure there is, but I, I don't know uh, what it is. I know that uh, the most efficient green plants are about a half a percent uh, efficient, and as I mentioned, algae is, is three to five. So photovoltaics is even uh, at 15 percent, very considerably ahead. And the other uh, aspect uh, is that photovoltaics actually works as well or better in the winter, uh, so cold weather uh, the efficiency of the cells actually goes up slightly. Uh, of course, you have less sunlight, uh, but uh, it would be hard to grow uh, green plants uh, during that same season. One, thank you. One of you made reference to the need to extend the construction deadline, and I missed what that reference was to. Is that Mr. Gallagher? Uh, Could you tell me what you're referring to? Yeah, certainly. The, um, in in the uh, Recovery Act that was passed earlier this year, in order to obtain the grant in lieu of the investment tax credit for uh, renewable energy, uh, the project must get into construction by the end of 2010. Uh, right now, as some of the witnesses have mentioned, uh, the financing uh, uh, environment is quite challenging for, uh, for projects generally, for renewable projects in particular, and for, for technologies that are first being commercialized even more so. So when our finance guys are talking to the banks right now, they're finding that the, the banks are not prepared to loan us money uh, for the period of, of time that we need or at, at the interest rates that we need. So I think you'll see over the next year or two, the renewable energy in general and the solar industry in particular, uh, placing quite a lot of reliance on the Department of Energy's loan guarantee program. 
But that loan guarantee program takes some time to work through. And we are now almost six months into the Recovery Act period, and the, uh, the Department of Energy hasn't managed to get out the solicitations for the next round of loan guarantees. So it, we can't get into construction by the end of next year and thus be eligible for the grant unless we can get through the Department of Energy's loan guarantee process, which we haven't been able to start yet. So that was my point. Do, by the way, do, is your technology different, or how is it different from the Infinia approach using Stirling engines? It's very similar to Infinia's. Uh, we use a somewhat different uh, Stirling engine. They use what's called a free piston engine. Uh, we use what's called a reciprocating Stirling engine. Uh, but uh, the principle is quite similar. Our dish is, is larger. It's a 25 kilowatt dish versus a three kilowatt dish. But it's, uh, in principle, it's a very similar system. Do any of you have any suggestions about how to accelerate our loan guarantee program? If We'll be talking to the DOE. We, we do that, and I think they're making strides, and I know they're focused. But do you have any, have any suggestions how any of us can help, how you would suggest the department should go about this? We're looking for free input here. Well, I could say that uh, we think we've been hearing all the right things from the Department of Energy also. Uh, what we haven't seen is that the reg regulations being issued. Um, uh, they have to come out with the rules that are consistent with commercial banking practices so that we can use them. There were some problems with the, uh, the 1703 program passed into the 2005 Energy Policy Act that had some conditions on it that made it hard for companies to use. Uh, we think that DOE is going in the right direction, and probably uh, it would be useful to have a conversation with OMB, which we understand has to approve the DOE's rules before they can be issued. Thank you. Dr. Constance, um could you tell us about what you consider your major challenges? I mean, this is an amazingly exciting uh, field to those of us on the outside of it. What, what do you consider your biggest challenges? Are they technological or are they financial? At this point, they're mainly uh, just financial. You know, as I said, we've already financed our demonstration plan at Moss Landing, where we've had a pilot plan operating for about eight months now. But, uh, you know, there will be capturing, uh, you know, I believe about 100,000 tons of CO2 a year. Uh, that makes about 200,000 tons of building materials. So you, you can almost get profitable. Uh, you know, the SCM sells for $100 a ton. Um, but we're funding a lot of venues. Uh, you know, we really need uh, to, to build, a, say, a 50 megawatt demonstration plant is about $120 million. And, and to go from, we're a venture capital-backed startup, and you know, we, there's just not a way we can sell equity to raise that kind of money. So we, uh, we really need a significant amount. Following the first uh, larger scale plant, though, uh, it's, it's become apparent that it, we will be able to receive uh, financing uh, fairly readily. The problem in this chasm now is venues, not only in the United States, but around the world, you know, are looking back to the last eight years, you know, in the concept, are, are very fixated on geologic sequestration rather than a profitable uh, use for the CO2. Quick question. I know the building industry can be conservative about adopting new technologies. They want to make sure things last 100 years. Sure. What are the best things you can do to achieve that confidence? Well, we're, we're in pretty good shape. We, we gave a uh, AEA accredited uh, course at the World of Concrete, uh, which is the largest, you know, 80,000 person meeting. My vice president of materials development is the past president of the Merritt Concrete Institute. We have a 40,000 square foot lab in Los Gatos doing all the tests. We're in discussions with all the major uh, Portland cement companies. Um, we're, we're doing very, very well on, on that front. I, I personally hold over 70 issued patents on cement, and we're very confident about the technology. We're very confident about the carbon capture. We're achieving over 90% carbon capture in Moss Landing. Well, it's very exciting. Speaking as, uh, I think I'm the only uh, former cement truck driver on this panel, so I really appreciate your expertise on this. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Gentleman's time has expired. The chair briefly, the chair recognized the gentleman from New York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just had a couple of quick questions. One, uh, to uh, well, I have I haven't recognized the gentle lady from New York. Yet. Oh, excuse me. I will. I mean, from uh, California. Uh, Please, uh, gentle lady from California, Miss <laughs> Spears. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you to the learned uh, witnesses that we have. Um, before us today. Uh, a couple of questions to Mr. Gallagher and Dr. Sachs. 
You mentioned the, the difficult policy framework solar energy has had to contend with over the years and the fluctuating support for funding. What in your mind would represent a more permanent and longer lasting solution to these fluctuations that Congress has not yet seen fit to provide? If, if you look, uh, uh, I, I think there, there should be two components uh, to the guidance for such policy. One is the one that I mentioned in my testimony, that is to take into account uh, uh, what, what the externalities are, externalities to, say, uh, photovoltaic development, and, uh, and that is principally the price of fossil fuels. As I mentioned in my own experience, uh, I, I've seen it go from a hot field to a cold field uh, to a hot field to a cold field, and these changes can take place over as little as a, a one-month period of time, depending on the price of oil. So somehow uh, policy has to compensate for that. The other element uh, is already in place in, in policy in some countries. Uh, for example, uh, uh, Germany has a feed-in tariff, uh, which uh, has helped uh, renewable energy greatly, not just photovoltaics, but wind as well. And that feed-in tariff, that is, uh, uh, you get paid for every kilowatt hour of electricity uh, fed into the grid, that feed-in tariff uh, declines in a programmed way over time. And uh, <clears throat> that lets people know, gives some stability for uh, what uh, is, is likely to happen. Uh, of course, it may be subject to change, but, uh, but uh, is likely to happen. And people can make plans accordingly. And uh, I think it's important for that uh, rate of decline to take its cue from the learning curve for that industry, uh, not, not uh, to be motivated by other factors, but to recognize uh, that industries uh, have their own rate of decline of cost, and that learning curve has a different slope for different industries, and uh, the pre-programmed rate of decline should be keyed uh, to that learning curve. I would, I would say uh, three quick things. Um, one, Congress took one terrific step last fall with the uh, extension of the investment tax credit for eight years, which pr provides some durability. Second, Congress could enact a meaningful renewable energy standard this year as part of the bill, the bill that the House has already passed. And third, Congress could create a permanent clean energy bank to, pr to provide source of funding going forward. All right, thank you. Uh, Dr. Constance, I was struck by your um, statement in which you kind of chastise us, uh, and probably rightfully so, for uh, kind of picking winners and losers, which is a big bugaboo of mine, where there have been tax incentives legislated exclusively for geologic sequestration, uh, but not for alternative forms of capture and conversion. Could you expand upon that for us? If you read the legislation, uh, it's written prescriptively uh, for a specific method of geologic sequestration. And uh, it also, you know, in discussions with DOE and, and uh, the bodies, uh, it's made very clear that the, the funds are already directed for geologic projects and, and, and geologic sequestration projects, which of course, are going to benefit people that build separation equipment and build people that build pipelines and people that drill wells, you know, has been very crafted. Specifically, uh, you know, I have an analyst report that shows a trillion dollar market opportunity for the, the builders of uh, carbon separation equipment and, and the, uh, the people that you know, own rights to the, the reservoirs and are going to be pumping, the, the, the legislation is very, very prescriptive. I can't say it more strongly. So it's almost rigged is what you're saying. It absolutely is. I mean, you, you can talk to anybody at DOE. You can, in fact, even in the industrial use program, which was recently uh, brought out, um, after a lot of talking to people on Capitol Hill, they. They took a $1.4 billion program 
and said, okay, well, we'll just take 1.3 billion and target it specifically for geologic sequestration, and then we'll have this other 100 million that we'll put for every other project out there, and we'll call, you know, we'll call that useful. And, uh, and, and part of the inaccuracy is that, for example, my technology, we're making product every day, tons and tons of product. You know, um, as the gentleman from AEP said, they're going to be the very first people to take a single molecule from CO2, take it through the whole process and get it into the ground. They're the leaders in that. So they're five years behind us. But from DOE's point of view, that's a proven technology, and, and we're still in the R&D stage, even though we're making product that can be used every day. You know, it's, 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 it's like the world's gone mad. <laughs> Dr. Constance, yeah. could you provide me with a, a document that would spell that out specifically, and I'd like to share it with the, the chairman of the committee? Absolutely. And so happy the bill, to. as you know, is still working its way through the Senate, and we can fix mistakes if, in fact, this would be classified as one. But certainly having the opportunity for more uh, institutions and, and companies to participate is to all of our interests. And I, I don't like the idea that this has been so constrained. So I would appreciate that. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, the mistake we made was uh, what the founders did in creating the Senate. Uh, I recognize the gentleman from New York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, uh, quickly, uh, Dr. Sachs and uh, Mr. Gallagher, you both talked about uh, storage issues having to do with, uh, uh, with renewables that are not uh, uh, round the clock uh, or whether, you know, reliable. And uh, so what do you see as the leading Three or you know, what's your favorite uh, uh, horse in the race in terms of storing electricity from solar or wind? Um, well, of course, the the best uh, uh, storage technology that's in operation today is pumped hydro, where you have a, a two pond system and there's you, you store uh, water in the in the lake below and you pump it uphill at night when there's a lower power demand and you run it downhill to create energy uh, during the day when you need the power. A couple other uh, promising technologies. A number of the uh, concentrating solar power technologies are using molten salt for storage to, to uh, store heat uh, and generate power later in the day. Uh, uh, there's also a lot of interest uh, in compressed air energy storage. Uh, our parent company has taken a small uh, in, in interest in an R&D company that's working on compressed air energy storage as well. Uh, I think storage is a, it's a very promising area. Uh, one thing that I would I would uh, encourage you to think about is that um, the storage can do basically two things for a renew renewable energy uh, system or for a grid operator. It can either uh, it can help reduce the cost of producing energy for the for the developer by uh, allowing it to produce more energy and more uh, at more over more hours, or it can essentially help the grid operator uh, by providing some grid integration services, grid stability kinds of services. Today, storage is too expensive to make uh, it worthwhile for the developer to do from an economic perspective. Uh, so we should really think about the grid stability and grid integration value of storage and think about where the storage obligation, if it's to be placed, should be placed. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sachs? So, uh, I think uh, Mr. Gallagher had a, a very good uh, list of technologies. I, I would add uh, the very attractive proposition of, uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, of coupling uh, storage to a reduction in need for uh, for oil for transportation uh, that that could be by uh, plug-in hybrids uh, run on batteries uh, it, uh, there are also efforts at uh, taking the electricity from renewables and turning them into into other forms of chemical uh, storage uh, batteries being electrochemical these would be chemical forms and then running uh, transportation vehicles uh, on that form uh, I'll also point out uh, that a uh, portfolio of uh, renewables helps greatly uh, to mitigate the swings uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the availability. For example, uh, on, on a seasonal basis, wind complements uh, solar uh, being more available in the winter, solar more, more available in the summer. Uh, geothermal is particularly interesting because it, it has the uh, possibility of providing uh, some of, of the base load uh, and being dispatchable uh, power. 
Thank you. I just want to get my second question for the uh, CCS folks on the panel, which is, are any of you now, or do you know of anybody who is working on uh, carbon capture and sequestration from gas-fired uh, power plants? They, too, emit carbon dioxide. They don't have anywhere near the particulate emissions of coal, and I understand that's where most of our work is going right now, it's because of the need to bring coal uh, from a the more uh, polluting uh, source of power into a cleaner uh, realm, but uh, right down the road from my street, there's a thousand megawatt uh, gas-fired power plant that uh, sits on the Iroquois pipeline uh, in Dover Plains, New York, that uh, uh, is most likely going to be built. And I'm curious uh, what's available, uh, and is there a discussion going on about capturing carbon from gas-fired plants as well? And for to anybody. Yeah. There's an interesting project by Mitsubishi in Vietnam, of all places, where they are looking at a 1,200 megawatt natural gas-fired power plant and capturing the CO2 from it and using that CO2 in enhanced oil recovery offshore, which kind of combines a whole bunch of ideas we're talking about here. But, uh, but don't underestimate things going on in Asia. Uh, but, but the people are looking at that, and I, I think uh, there's various issues. The biggest one in my mind is that the capacity factors of gas-fired plants tend to be lower than coal units, and so they're not operating all the time, and so, you know, your, your investment is sitting idle. Uh, but if we move to a carbon-constrained world, those gas units will run more, and, and those economics will, will begin to favor uh, capture from, from gas units. I think that the, um, I, would, I would say that the, the first problem in capture from gas plants is having captured it, what do you do with it? And in your district, which are one of our plants we built in Astoria, so I'm somewhat close to Westchester, um, the, the problem is having captured it, there aren't any oil wells in Westchester that I know of, and what do you do with the carbon dioxide? And so, and that's a significant element in the costs. We're building a lot of roads though. So. Yes, you do. <laughs> That's true. Um, but the answer, I think, is that as you develop um, sequestration sites, uh, you, can, you can then think about, oh, I have a place to, to put the carbon dioxide. Our plant will be next to a natural gas plant in Linden. It, it's the Linden station, and it, it sends uh, power to uh, uh, Staten Island. Um, and that's a perfectly reasonable place to employ the same technologies that Gary's talking about, um, in chilled ammonia capture, um, you capture the CO2, and now, now that plant will have a way to get rid of it. I mean, having captured it, you can do something with it. If the, if the value of the carbon emissions is sufficiently high, it will find an economic incentive to do that. And that's the point of a cap-and-trade bill. Yes, sir. It's, it's an interesting question you ask. I don't hear it asked very often. I think it needs to be looked at more closely. If you look at requiring a 90% capture, say, on a coal unit, that translates to about 80% capture needed on a uh, combined cycle gas plant. So yes, if you're going to require at those levels, you need significant controls on gas as well. One of the technical challenges with capturing CO2 from gas uh, turbines is the amount of oxygen that flows through the system is much higher in the combustion gas from a gas-fired plant. And oxygen is an enemy of some of the capture technologies for uh, post-combustion. So I think there's some, some um, problems, some challenges to be overcome in implementing capture technologies with gas. But at deep levels of required reduction on coal, you have to start looking at gas as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, as we uh, end this hearing, let me just uh, say, tell you, make sure that you all understand that the members uh, leaving and coming in had absolutely nothing to do with your testimony. Uh, the way this place operates is there are multiple committees going on, and some are doing markups, and, uh, which means voting to get something out of committee, so people are, are running between committees. Uh, we appreciate your uh, testimony. And as we consider uh, new technologies and the role the uh, Congress will play, uh, I think you will find that your uh, testimony will be quoted, sometimes out of context, uh, <laughs> but it, it will be quoted. And so we appreciate very much the time uh, that you've taken to uh, provide us with uh, the benefit of, of your uh, august thinking. 
Thank you very much. This hearing has adjourned. I think your, your answer to the policy question was, uh, was politically much more sensitive than mine. <laughs> <laughs>